Today I'm going to be modding a Nintendo Switch V2. This is a patched console, as indicated by the serial number, so it's going to need a mod chip installed. The chip I chose is the RP2040 Core, and you can pick these up for about 10 to 15 pounds online. We need the chip itself and the V2 flex cable. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started installing the mod chip in our Nintendo Switch V2. Now, I do quickly want to say that this is not a project for beginners. The soldering in this is really small, so if you don't have experience soldering, then this is definitely not something that I would attempt as a first project. Get some soldering experience or see if there's anyone you know or anyone you can pay to do this installation for you. I've seen many people try this as their first soldering project and completely ruin their consoles. If you're experienced with SMD soldering, then I'm sure you'll be absolutely fine. And saying that, I did have a few people comment on the last video saying that this was their first soldering project and that they did successfully do it. But I have also seen a lot of people who did this as a first time project and completely ruin their console. When installing mod chips like this one, it's always a risk that you damage the console. So if there's anything valuable on your console, like save games, anything like that, then just make sure you back up all of those before starting this project. So without further ado, let's get started installing the mod chip. To begin, we need to disassemble the console down to its motherboard. We only need two types of screw bits, those being the Y tip and the Phillips head. I like to use my iFixit kit, these are about £15, but have everything you need to take most things apart. I'll leave an Amazon link down below to where you can buy it. We will begin by removing the four Y-tip screws from the back side of the console. After that, we remove the Phillips screws, one being at the top of the console and two being at the bottom by the USB-C charging port. And finally, two more Phillips screws, one on each side of the Joy-Con rails. Then there is a Phillips screw under the kickstand. Once all of those screws are removed, we can pry off the back plate to expose the internal metal shield. Then we need to remove all of the Phillips screws that are on the metal shield. There is also one screw covering the micro SD port to remove, and then we remove this port by unclipping it from the main board.
Once all of these screws are removed, we can simply remove the metal shield. Next, take out the heatsink. This simply requires three Phillips screws. The heatsink is stuck in with some adhesive at the top of the console near the fan, so just be careful when removing it not to bend the heatsink. We need to unclip this shield over the CPU to access the mod chip solder points. There are these tiny metal clips that need bending outwards to release this shield. Once it's removed, clean the thermal paste from the shield and the CPU. On the CPU, the thermal paste is usually caked in between the capacitors that we need to solder to, so I like to use a soft toothbrush to get in between the components and make sure it's all cleaned properly. Next, we need to remove the EMMC memory chip, as this is clipped onto the mod chip instead of the motherboard when we're done with the installation. It's easy to unclip, but it usually takes this metal shield with it due to the strong adhesive. If it does, then simply peel off the shield and reattach it. Now let's head under the microscope and prepare the flex cable. We want to begin by adding some solder to the flex cable. To do this, we will add some flux to the cable and then pre-tin all of the points with some leaded solder. This includes the four pads on SPI1 and SPI2 and the two larger anchor points on the bottom of the cable.
Once the cable is prepared, we can insert it on top of the CPU and push the anchor points under this metal ground shield on the motherboard. We will begin by soldering down the anchor points. When doing this you must push down the area around SP1 and SP2 to ensure that they're flush to the board. If the flex is not flush down to the board then we're going to have a much more difficult time when soldering to these capacitors. Now it's time for the hard part, soldering the capacitors on points SP1 and SP2. These points are very fragile and also prone to overheating, so ensure that you don't hold your iron on them for too long. Soldering these should be as simple as tapping your iron on each point for a few seconds, making the connection, and then leaving it alone. I also cannot stress how important flux is for this part. In this case, it's much better to use flux in this case, it's much better to use too much flux than too little. Adding more flux cannot damage the points, but using too little and having cold solder joints could result in cracking solder joints and could also affect the longevity of this install. Once each point is confirmed to be clearly connected and not bridging, clean the area with some isopropyl alcohol and ensure that all of the flux is removed. The difficult part of the install is now done and there is no more soldering. Before we continue with this project, it's time to give a little mention to today's video sponsor, JLC PCB. Have you ever wanted to design your own electronics? Maybe some custom machine parts in plastic or metal? Well, today's sponsor, JLC PCB, allows you to do just that. With JLC PCB's cheap and affordable services, everybody can bring their own DIY projects to life. Their website simply lets you upload your own custom files for PCBs or 3D printed parts and have them delivered to your door in no time for cheap and affordable prices. They give you endless customization for PCB design with exclusive silk screen colors and even flexible PCBs. You can pick different colors and materials for 3D printed parts or different types of metals for CNC machine stuff. No matter what the project is, JLC PCB has a service to help you bring your project to life. Visit JLCPCB's website in the description below to get started. The next step is installing the EMMC we removed earlier onto the mod chip. This is as simple as ensuring that the orientation is correct and then pushing down the EMMC into the port on the mod chip. Next, we need to connect the flex cable to the mod chip using the ribbon cable connector. To do this, place the mod chip on top of the CPU like this, and then push the cable into the connector, ensuring that the port release tab is pushed up. Once the cable's in, push the release tab back down. Now the mod chip can be flipped over and we need to plug it into the motherboard where the original EMMC chip used to be. Now we can test the mod chip, but before connecting the battery, we should place something between the chip and the console to ensure that we get no short circuits. You can use some paper or maybe something plastic. I'm just using some tissue paper. Now we can connect the battery, 
press the power button, and if we get the Pico fly screen, then we've successfully installed the mod chip. Now it's time to put the console back together, starting with cleaning the heatsink and applying some new thermal paste. The only difference in assembling a modded console compared to a regular one is the modification needed for the metal shield. We need to cut some of the metal shield out to ensure that there is enough room for the mod chip to not get squished and also so it doesn't short out against anything. You can simply use a pair of scissors to cut the metal shield and also apply some electrical tape to the back of the mod chip to prevent it moving around in the console after assembly. So I'm not going to cover the whole reassembly process as I believe it's been covered hundreds of times on YouTube and if you go back into my other videos on the same tablet, uh, the same like Nintendo Switch console type, I also covered it in those videos. Essentially the only things that are different when reassembling a modded console compared to a non-modded one is the cutting of the metal shield and also adding a bit of electrical tape to make sure that the chip doesn't flop around in the console once the back plate is back on. And that is it for today. If you followed this video successfully, then you now have a Nintendo Switch V2, which is completely modded with the RP2040 mod chip. Thanks so much for watching. If you're unsure what to do next and want to know how to set up the custom firmware on your console, then there'll be a video right there showing you how to do that. If this video helped you out at all, please consider subscribing to the channel. I have lots of more cool stuff planned, new consoles to mod and just new projects to show off. If you liked the video, please press that like button and let me know down in the comments below whether this is something you're going to try on your own console. And feel free to update everyone and tell us how it went. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.